On my first trip to Israel, I could not believe how close in proximity all of these places were that I read about in Scripture. And in this episode, in part three of Jesus in Galilee, we're gonna talk about an itty bitty bitty section where Jesus spent an enormous amount of time and we're gonna unpack those cities and I'm gonna tell you, hang with me to the end because what Jesus does and says about those cities will leave you with your jaw on the ground. So let's dive in and see what we've got. Friends, hello there. In our last episode, Brad Nelson walked us through the Herodians of Tiberias. And we're now going to work our way up the shoreline to the very northern part of the Sea of Galilee to a cluster of three cities that we actually call the Evangelical Triangle. And you'll understand that by the end of the episode. But this particular area is home to what we just simply call religious Jews, meaning not everybody there was religious, but the highest percentage of the people were religious Jews. These are people who are passionate about following the scriptures. And so central to everything they did was around the word of God, was around scripture. And we actually spent an entire episode in our Rabbis and Disciples mini-series talking about the Jewish educational system and how formative the word of God was to the religious folks in Jesus's day, particularly around the Sea of Galilee in what we call the Evangelical Triangle. And so scripture was central to everything. In addition to the religious Jews, you have this sense of community that is very important to them. And so people lived in what are called insula or insulae, plural, and these are extended family units. And so grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, you know, some uncles and their spouses and brothers and sisters all lived together in these extended family units. Community was a big deal. Here is another artist's rendering of what an insula looked like in the area of the religious triangle or the evangelical triangle. Additionally, you take the word of God and community and together you get synagogue. Now, the synagogue didn't become a formal institution until after AD 70 with the burning of the temple. Um, in Jesus' day, the synagogue was like a community center where people hung out during the day. This is where the word of God in the scrolls would be housed. Um, they did have a synagogue service on Saturday. But these were the things that religious Jews valued. And you see them all coming together and permeating society among these three cities that we are going to be looking at of these religious Jews. And so we're going to begin in Chorazin. And Chorazin is two miles from the Sea of Galilee. And here is an aerial shot of the ruins of Chorazin today. So you can see clearly down to the Sea of Galilee. And you see ruins here to the left of the road, on the south side of the road, and to the north side of the road. And we have probably the ruins from the time of Jesus off the northeast side of the road, and it's not been excavated much at all. And so we do believe that there would have been a synagogue in Jesus's day, but the synagogue that you actually see in the site is over here in a time period that's later in that third to fifth centuries AD, but you have a very well-preserved synagogue here that as you see here in the entrance, here is what an artist's rendering looks like of that. And the two primary features we have here is a Torah closet where the scrolls would have been housed. And then we have this seat right here. And this is a replica. The original is in the Israel Museum. But when you go to Matthew 23, you see Jesus talking to the crowds about the scribes and the Pharisees who sit on Moses' seat. And we have a Moses' seat. And the reason why this is such an important archaeological find is because prior to this find in Chorazin, no Moses' seat has been found in an archaeological excavation before. And so people would stand to read the Word of God, they would sit to teach, and this is where people in the synagogue would teach and instruct people who were listening. 
Uh, Corazine from rabbinic literature was known for its wheat, which allowed it to be a food processing center because everything in the site is made out of the local rock. It is basalt and it's actually volcanic. And it is black, it is porous, it is really strong, and it is sharp, perfect for grinding grain. And as far as our Gospels or the rest of the New Testament is concerned, zero stories are recorded from Chorazin. So from Chorazin, if you go three and a half miles to the southeast, you come to Bethsaida. And when you leave Chorazin or even Capernaum and you go east into Bethsaida, you're actually moving into a different region. So let's just scale back for a moment. And you can see all these different regions that were part of the first century world. Now, when Herod the Great died, his area that he was ruling fell to three of his sons. The Decapolis is outside of Herod the Great's jurisdiction. It's also outside of the jurisdiction of his boys. But Antipas got Galilee and Perea. Archelaus got Samaria, Judea, and Idumea, and then Philip got uh, Batanea, Trachonitis, as well as Golanitis, and a couple of other regions as well. Um, for our purposes, we'll just make it real clean and clear, and we'll just call it Golanitis. But what we see here, too, is that by Jesus' day, this area was now under the control of Roman governors, Pilate. In AD 6, Archelaus got deposed because he was a horrific ruler. Rome put in governors. And in Jesus' day, this is the jurisdiction for Pilate. So if we go back up to the Sea of Galilee, you see that you move from Antipas' territory into Philip's territory. And we come to Bethsaida. Bethsaida means house of fish. And of course, it's connected to fishing on the Sea of Galilee. But it was also known as Bethsaida Julius. Um, Philip actually elevated the status of the village or the town to an actual city called a polis and gave it the name Bethsaida Julius, naming it after Caesar Augustus's daughter, the ruling emperor of Rome when Philip came to power. So we're expecting to see something along the lines of fishing because it's in the name. But again, we actually have two different possibilities for biblical Bethsaida. You have what is known as Etel, and then you have El Araj. You can clearly see that El Araj is much closer to the water. Um, and there have been some interesting ways in which the archaeologists of Etel have said, well, the water would have come all the way up to this location back in Jesus' day. There are some problems with that. But there's a huge debate that is going on, and I don't think it's going to be solved anytime soon. But if you go to the biblical Bethsaida today, all the signs are going to take you to Etel. And as you walk through Etel, you're going to see some fantastic ruins. You can walk along and see some insula from the first century world, or at least that's what is uh, presumed by the excavations, is that this is either you know first century or maybe even early second century. But most of the ruins at Etel date to a time period after Jesus. Very few of the um, you know, archeological excavations have yielded results from the first century world. And then all the way up near the water is El Arash. And El Arash is right where the Jordan River starts going in. You can see this is the excavation area. It's a relatively new excavation. And so every year we're like learning more. And the finds at El Arash seem to be more of the biblical Bethsaida. But here's what we have from a textual side is that in John 1 it says, Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. And so we have three disciples that come from Bethsaida, but because we know from Matthew chapter 4 that Jesus calls Peter and Andrew and then James and John, and then specifically in Luke 5, we are told that James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were Simon's partners. That's a business term. So they're in the fishing industry together. So Philip, Peter, Andrew, and likely James and John are all from the same place, Bethsaida, which is pretty remarkable when you think of nearly half the disciples came from Bethsaida, and Bethsaida, like Chorazin, maybe 1,500 people. It's, it's not a big place whatsoever. 
And in our gospel stories, contrary to Corzine, where there are zero stories, we actually have two stories. I know, whoa, two stories. We got just two stories. We've got the feeding of the 5,000 that actually happened on the plains of Bethsaida, so it's outside the city. And then you have the healing of the blind man that happened on the edge of the city. And that's all we get from Bethsaida. But we've got one more city to look at or a town, and that is Capernaum. And for those of you who saw part one, you will know this is the location that Jesus went to when he left Nazareth, which is where he grew up. He went to Capernaum. Now, I didn't talk about this in part one, but in Matthew 9.1, it says that Jesus crossed over the Sea of Galilee and came to his own town. Now, this is a reference to this being the center of Jesus's ministry. This is home base for him, so much so that Matthew calls it his own town. And for those of you who've been to Capernaum before, you'll go, yeah, this is where I walked in. You come walking into the main entrance, you can go walking down to the water. Uh, but the two main structures that you see is you see this black building here, and then you see the white building in the back. And as the drone continues to pan around, you can see here that this is a beautifully preserved, massive synagogue. It's the best preserved and the largest synagogue that has been found in all of Israel. Um, and we'll talk about that here in just a few moments. But here's a really great artist rendering of what Capernaum looked like in Jesus's day. Some of you may recall the story about where Jesus is teaching and they lower the paralytic through the roof. Yeah, that happened in Capernaum. And you can see here um, with kind of the mud thatched roofs and you can see how everything is really tight living spaces. Again, you have insula. You have insula in Chorazin. You have insula in Bethsaida. You have insula here in Capernaum. And then you can see all the boats out here. And Bethsaida is called the House of Fish. But here's what's really cool is that a number of years ago, um, there was a drought with the Sea of Galilee, which is not cool, by the way. But what was helpful is as the water went down, they found more docks at Capernaum than any of the other cities around the entire Sea of Galilee. So we know it was a major bustling you know, fishing operation there. We also know that it was for food processing as well, like Chorazin, because you've got all these, again, basalt rocks that are really great for grinding grain. And then from the synagogue, um, you can look across the way, and we saw the, the black roofed top, and this is actually preserving a ruin that we read about here in Mark 1. In verses 29 to 30, it talks about that after Jesus and the disciples, they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew. And this is a story where Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. Now, for those of you who are aware that custom was is that when you got married, the woman would follow the man to his family's house. Uh, you would expect Peter's house to actually be in Bethsaida because that's where he's from. But we don't know the circumstances, but they eventually came over and lived in Capernaum. Perhaps, you know, Peter's father-in-law passed away and they were helping to care for his mother-in-law. But either way you shake it, when Jesus is in Capernaum, this is where he is staying. And this is what this archaeological ruin is believed to be. This is a massive building that is protecting it. And it's a really cool story when you look at all the archaeology. But the dominant white feature at the site is the limestone synagogue. And again, not made out of the black basalt, but out of the white limestone. Again, very well preserved. This dates to after the time of Jesus, but the foundation of it dates to the time of Jesus. Um, we know from Luke 7 that we actually have a centurion, and a centurion was one who led a hundred soldiers. And we find out that in this passage in Luke 7 is that he actually built the synagogue, which is just shocking that a Roman soldier would have been responsible for contributing to the building of the synagogue. And this makes sense when you're reminded that Capernaum is on the international highway. What's more is that when you're jumping from Antipas to Philip or from Philip back to Antipas, this is where you would have a tax collector's booth. And we have evidence of one such booth in Matthew 9, 9, when Matthew talks about his own story of Jesus saying, come follow me, he was at the tax collector's booth. The other big thing to note is that Capernaum was a rabbinical center, that when you get into rabbinic literature, you have quote after quote after quote of rabbis who are in Capernaum. 
And this is one of the reasons why I believe Jesus chose Capernaum is that it was a place of religious Jews. It was people who knew the text inside and out. Jesus could do things in Capernaum and in the religious triangle or the evangelical triangle that he wouldn't be able to do in some other places. And so we see that this is a very important aspect of Capernaum as a whole, where all of these values of the religious Jews come together, and it is happening in a very strategic location in Capernaum, which again, as we talked in part one, is a long way away from Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was the other big rabbinical center. And by the end of the series, we're going to talk more about Capernaum versus Jerusalem. But for now, just realize that these are two major rabbinical centers. Now, here's what's astonishing, is that 13 stories took place in Capernaum. And again, we estimate Capernaum to be around 1,500 people in Jesus' day. And when there are no stories in Chorazin and two in Bethsaida, we've got 13 here in Capernaum. And so it gives you a sense of what's going on in these three cities, and it leads us to this last passage where we're going to pull it all together. It says this, Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it'll be more bearable for Sodom on that day of judgment than for you. We've been talking about how the majority of Jesus's ministry happened around the Sea of Galilee. No, the majority of Jesus's ministry happened in this little triangle that we call the Evangelical Triangle. Two miles, three and a half miles, two and a half miles. That's it. And Jesus does the majority of his miracles and his teachings and these locations. And we don't know what happened in Bethsaida. We only got two stories. We don't know what happened in Chorazin. We got zero. We know some things that happened in Capernaum. But if this is home base and this is where Jesus is doing everything, story after story, teaching after teaching happened here. And Jesus says, woe to all three of you. You did not listen. You did not repent. It is better for Sodom and Gomorrah than it is for you. And it just makes you ask the question of these religious Jews who are passionate about following the scriptures, what happened? What, what happened in that triangle that caused Jesus to say this? I mean, was Jesus too familiar to them? Did they see him a little bit too casually? Did they like some of his teachings, but other teachings kind of pushed them too far that they said, yeah, I like this aspect of him, but I'll kind of like, I'll let that piece go. Uh, did Jesus just not fulfill their expectations? Because there was a lot of ideas about what the Messiah would be doing in the first century world, and there are a lot of things that Jesus didn't do that people were expecting. You know, what, what happened? What was going on in that moment. We don't know. I mean, you can make some cases for, you know, a lack of, of fulfilling expectations. We know there are places when Jesus is saying, you know, love your enemy, and people are like, yeah, that's pushing me too far. Uh, you have the whole bread of life discourse in John 6, where Jesus says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And we know a lot of people walked out the back door on that day. So we know that Jesus was pushing them. But as we just think about this for us today, the question I want to ask is, how does that not become us? And I just want to leave us just with one thought to really wrestle with as it relates to this episode, and it's this. It's not enough to know about Jesus. Followers are called to follow. That maybe for many of us, we know the scriptures, we know the stories, but we're not fully giving ourselves to Jesus. We're picking and choosing. We like this aspect of what Jesus offers, but I don't like this aspect of what Jesus offers. Maybe, maybe Jesus has 
has disrupted our expectations of what we thought he was going to do for us. And we've just disengaged. Uh, maybe we're trying to follow things to the letter of the law that we've lost the spirit of the law. We've lost the essence of being with Jesus, of listening, of learning, of following. And we're just, you know, accustomed to checking off this box and checking off that box. You know, there are a lot of reasons why people didn't follow Jesus in the evangelical triangle. But let's forget about them for a moment and just ask, what is it about us? What is it about our journey with Jesus that needs to grow, that we need to follow? Because maybe we've just gotten so casual with Jesus that we just think Jesus is in terms of, well, he's probably cool with this in my life, he's probably cool with that. But maybe we just have to step back and say, as a follower, am I fully following Jesus? Because the last thing we want to hear is, woe to you, when we know that Jesus has done so much for us in our own lives. So may you wrestle with that. May you think about the implications. I know this pushes me every single time that I walk into Coors and Bethsaida and Capernaum. I'm, I'm, I'm asking the same thing, like, where am I not following well? because I want Jesus to say, well done, good and faithful servant, not woe to you. I met you, I gave my word to you, I did things for you, and it wasn't enough for you to follow. May we follow well, and as always, may we walk out the text well in our life.